Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is the Environment Committee of the City of Rehoboth Beach, uh, our Thursday, June 16 meeting. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone. We've got quite a few participants. Uh, we don't usually have participants in the audience, so we welcome it very much. Uh, we also have City staff Linda is helping us run the, the meeting smoothly, and we've got City Arborist Liz Lingo with us as well. So thank you for, for being here. I'm going to do a roll call. Mr. Charlie Garlow. Present. Ms. Heather Metz. Mr. Eric Seward. Here. Uh, Joseph Fessio. Here. Mary Peck. Here. Nettie Green. Here. And uh, the chair is present. And we have a quorum to conduct business. Uh, we've got one, sets of, one set of uh, minutes that uh, was sent out prior to the meeting um, from our May 19th meeting. Does anyone have any corrections, comments? Actually, Edward, um, no, I'm still working on those. Um, there was a backlog of minutes so um, okay. of, of previous meetings. So those were sent out and approved in the last meeting, but um, the May 19th minutes I'll send out next week, along with along with today's meeting minutes. So you'll you'll see those next week. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> we we did have quite a backlog that we were. <laughs> um, Linda was was great enough to do an audit of all of the previous few years, and and we did have some some catching up to do. And and thank you, um, yeah, Joe, we're, for we're all for helping. At this point, correct, Linda. I, I, um, Okay. Oh, great. Thanks. Well, thank you, Linda. Thank you, Joe, for, for helping that. We will defer the approval of the minutes until the next meeting then. Um, we had one uh, bit of correspondence that was um, related to phasing out of gas-powered lawn equipment. So we will uh, discuss that um, when it comes time in the, in the agenda. Um, and we'll go to old business, a discussion of a sustainable climate action plan. Uh, the proposal that was sent to the mayor and commissioners um, is attached and part of the uh, backup for the, for the meeting. Um, I, at this time, we're just, we're waiting some direction from, from the city on that. Um, but I have, it, uh, I have it on the agenda in case there are any updates. Um, or any discussion? Does anyone have anything? I, I, I don't want to put them on the spot, but Mayor Mills, do you have any uh, thoughts on when we may discuss that in a city uh, workshop meeting? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, uh, I have broached the subject with the city manager because I thought uh, it might be that uh, he would take the lead on this. Uh, so no, I don't have a date, but it's on our radar. We, um, we love your sense of humor. Thank you. Oh, I get that from Charlie Garland. <laughs> uh, as you all know, we, we, we have had a lot of, a lot of uh, pending agenda items um, this winter and fall and going into the summer. Uh, the CDP is finally Approaching the, the end of its uh, life and uh, outdoor dining and things like that. So, I think as we go into the end of the summer, the fall, maybe our our agendas are loosening up a little bit. Uh, so, thank you, Mayor Mills, for for commenting on that. Um, next on the agenda, any other comments on the climate action plan? Uh, next on the agenda is the um, discussion related to gas-powered landscape. Uh, equipment and use of them in the city of Rehoboth Beach. The recommendations uh, by a few of the committee members is attached to the agenda. Um, does, does someone want to lead us off on, on a brief background? Um, and then we'll open it up for further discussion. And we've got the city arborist here to weigh in as well. Uh, I could start up a conversation if you'd like. Great. The correspondence we received from Julie Okte. Uh, is, sec is basically seconding previous emails that our committee has received on the topic, objecting to the noisy and the fumes and contributing to global warming, et cetera, that comes from gasoline-powered uh, lawn equipment, mowers and blowers and all that sort of stuff, and uh, recommending that we had phased out and or eventually banned that sort of equipment in favor of cleaner electric-powered equipment. The city of Lewis 
uh, as we've discussed in previous meetings, has adopted a similar sort of proposal with a phasing out uh, by 2025, I believe, and uh, it's open to continuing discussion, I guess. Is there anything else that I need? Oh, that would be helpful, wouldn't it? Get me to repeat all that. <laughs> uh, Mary, did you have anything to you? You helped lead the charge and and looked a lot of research um, and looked at what Lewis has is doing. Uh, did you have anything to add? No, not today. I think we where we are is that. Um, um, we, you were going to have the arborist speak to some landscaping issues. You wanted to hear from her before you decided how we were going to go forward. So I think it's that's where we are. So I, just a, a little bit more of the history. Some of the f discussions that we've had previously was having the, the city lead by example. So initially having the city, the thought was the city would be the first to um, to do this, and then we would phase it in with with commercial and and, and residences. Um, so, Liz, could we? Um, I, I think we all understand the compli how um, it it could be costly and complicated, and there may be pushback. So, we certainly wanted to get your expertise um, and your opinion. Sure. So, apologies because I haven't really followed along with your guys' committee. Um, has anybody spoken to contractors about this? Any feedback solicited? Uh, we, we, we have not at, okay. uh, up until we, this point. We did make that suggestion that we did have that idea. So okay, that, that would definitely be the first, first step. Um, and I'm sure if you guys wanted, I could find a couple of contractors to come in and speak to it. Because my understanding is that the good contractors, the ones that are keeping up with the industry, this is the way things are going, electric. You look at steel, you look at Husqvarna, the two biggest brand names, that's what they're working on. Commercially, we don't have the technology yet to do what we need to do with electric. Residentially, it's not a problem. A little electric handheld blower, electric weed whackers, that's what I have in my house, it's easy. To blow off a city hall parking lot with 120 mile an hour electric blower, will take two to three times as long and not be as good. So I think we eliminate a lot of the noise advantages when we're doubling and tripling our work. By 2025, could the technology be there for the blowers? That's very, very possible. Um, in terms of the mowers, um, they're completely exempt from Lewis's ordinance. So I think that's important to note because that's what we get the noise complaints about mainly. Um, it's interesting though, this past year we had to buy a new zero turn riding mower and we, we have state contracts uh, that we can take advantage of in purchasing and one of them is with John Deere. So to get a John Deere riding mower commercial grade, what we need is about give or take $10,000 on state contract. I got an estimate or a, a quote from the main company that does the electric riding mowers, zero turn comparable to what we have. And instead of 10,000, it was 30,000. I don't think that's a fair burden to place on anybody right now to tell a landscape company that they have to replace a fleet of mowers paying $30,000 a pop is just, I don't think it's reasonable at this point. By 2025, it may be possible. Maybe everything will cost 30,000 by then, or maybe, or maybe they'll come down. I was hoping it'd be around 15, and I could go to my boss at the time and say, what do you think might be worth the extra 4,000? I didn't even go and tell her I got the estimate for 30 because it wasn't worth the time. You know, I, I don't think we can justify taxpayers' money going three times the price. Um, the other thing, to note is for like the tree companies, some of them are already using electric saws um, as the foreman adjusts to using them. It seems more choosing them because they're lighter. The problem is they do not make a chainsaw with a cutting bar longer than 14 inches. So you cannot safely remove a tree over that size. So you know how are you gonna remove a 30 inch tree safely? 
with a 14 inch saw, you're not. So once again, by 2025, maybe no problem. And that is where the industry is going. Some of the companies have transition plans. A big company, like the biggest one we see here for the trees, they replace their chainsaws every two to three years. So that's part of their plan because you have to think the landscaping and tree companies get complaints about noise from neighbors. Anything they can do to lessen those complaints, they're gonna do. I mean, a big landscape company, this could cost them a half a million dollars to convert to electric. That's not to say they're not gonna do it. It's just, I think we have to be very mindful that regulation should always, it's a tool, but it shouldn't be our first tool. So you should always want education, voluntary compliance, see how the industry is going. And I think naturally economics in the industry are going to get us where we wanna be. There will always be outliers. And maybe one day we'll need to regulate it for that, for the last 10% of companies that don't wanna upgrade, you know, that have been driving the same truck for 30 years and using the same lawnmower for 20. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of those people that I'm, I can think of a few that have worked in town my whole life. I can think of one that drives a light blue pickup truck and does the north area of Rehoboth. He will not be able to afford to convert to electric. He just will not work in Rehoboth anymore. You know, it's one guy with his truck from 1980 and one lawnmower. Um, and maybe that's okay. He may be retired by the time <laughs> it goes electric. Um, but I, I think those are important things to note is that what Lewis did isn't really what you guys seem to want. If we're really trying to deal with noise, I don't know how much that's gonna help us. And if we're talking environmentally, how do you think all these batteries get charged? You have two, three batteries per piece of equipment. There's two ways to charge them on site, a generator or the truck's diesel engine. So the cost of, say, an electric weed whacker or blower, let's just say they're $1,000. The comparable gas will be $1,000. But the electric, you then have to buy the $900 battery backpack. And you need two of them. And then you hook them up to your generator or your truck engine, and you charge them while you swap them out. So I don't think that really gets us the environmental impact either. I mean, we're still using running a truck all day, parking it somewhere where people don't hear it. It's not as loud, <laughs> possibly. Um, but I, there's too many unknowns, I think, in the industry right now to really start regu regulating this stuff. Residentially, it wouldn't be a problem if you wanted to go that method. It's just when we start talking, forcing companies and commercial maintenance to do it. But like I said, residents shouldn't be a problem to have an electric mower, or weed whacker, or blower, because say they, you can buy an electric push mower, the battery will last a half an hour, and most of our yards in town, that'll probably take care of them. <laughs> so that's, that's kind of my thought, is I think we're going too quickly towards the regulation and need to look at education, feedback, um, get industry, like somebody knowledgeable in the industry running a company to give their take. So like the owner of Spazato, I'm sure they have some sort of electric transition plan. I'm sure he'd be willing to come talk about it if we made it that far. Well, thank you, Liz. I, certainly your comments are enlightening um, to me. Any of the committee members have specific questions uh, for Liz or comments? What is, what is Lewis doing? No, the, it's, it's for everybody. So when I talk to Spazato, who's the biggest landscaper in the area, they don't have any commercial accounts in Lewis. It's single family homes. They have maybe 50 of them. It's not as big a deal. They'll just outfit one or two crews. Um, Lewis is banning the use of gas powered equipment. 2022 is just, um, I think like, the main pieces of equipment, the weed whacker and the blower is by 2025, so string trimmer, weed whacker. The mowers are exempt. And I think 2022 was like your outlier pieces of equipment, like I guess a, a bed tiller, I, I don't know what other, um, a 
pole pruning saw. So the, like a big company, they're mainly electric now anyways, the pole pruners. And that's not something a landscape company keeps on them. A, a tree company will have like one per crew, whereas you'll have like five to 10 chainsaws. Like you'll have two chainsaws per, per crew member on a tree company. So like if you had a crew, like Sussex Tree runs crews of five, they'll have 10 saws on their truck. So you do the math, $700 a saw to replace those. It's a lot of money. Now they're replacing them every two to three years anyways. You know, and most, he told me most of their foremen do prefer the electric climbing saws now, but it was kind of a, it's still kind of their own choice on what they feel safe using when they're risking their lives 70 feet in the air. And if somebody has been using a gas saw for 30 years and that's what he is comfortable using and wants to go home to his family or her family at the end of the day, who are we to say they can't use a gas saw to keep themselves safe? I, I find that a very hard pill to swallow personally. But take, take this as a grain of salt because I do think we are going electric. I think that is the future in a, a lot of things, not just the lands not just in the landscape industry. And I am support, supportive of that and think we should do electric where we can. I mean, I think the streets department has their little electric vehicles and that's worked out well as far as I know. Um, so it always should be just like when I got my price, I think it should always be something we're looking into and if there's comparable for a reasonable price, I mean, we have to be fiscally responsible, right? I can't get a $30,000 mower instead of a 10000 But if it was fourteen, my manager at the time might have said, we'll get another price or two for comparable electric and we'll go from there. But it was just so far off base. It wasn't worth <laughs> pursuing. Like I said, in three years, they may be the same price. I don't know. <laughs> um, I was going to uh, ask for the city's uh, grass and other things that are trimmed mm -hmm under contract or do we have some of our city employees doing that work we have the the beautiful sod that is irrigated and pretty and green and mowed perfectly like on Rehoboth Avenue that patch when you come in in the median that's done by Spazato generally every seven to ten days depending on weather it's a certain number 26 mows or 28 mows per season um, everything else is done by one part-time employee and where does that happen that the part-time employee does the other stuff? What is the other stuff? Is that around the lakes or? Every park and non-park area that we maintain, except for, um, I believe, the water department takes care of their own areas. So like along Route 1 and in Breezewood, they, they deal with that. Um, but yeah, one part-time, he probably does about, <coughs> only gets mowed every, we mow every other week for our like park sites and then um, like the Chamber of Commerce, the bandstand and a couple other little tiny spots like that get, uh, get mowed once a week. But majority of the stuff we do is every other week. What, what equipment does the city own? We own a backpack, like my, I can't speak to Public Works because they have their own stuff, but my one part-time and I, we have one weed whacker, three push mowers, a backpack blower, and um, one riding mower, and then um, an inherited truck and an inherited mower, thanks to uh, Wastewater and Streets Department. <laughs> and we have one contract with Swiss, with Sato? Mm -hmm. Yep, we have an ongoing contract with them. Charge these instruments is either hook it up to a generator or use the vehicle's engine to recharge? If you're on site, yeah, otherwise you'd have to have a, a place like a, a shopper. That's what I was going to ask you. When I worked, when I did field work for EPA, we used to have a warehouse that we charged everything, took it out for the day, you know, air monitoring, that kind of stuff, took it out for the day and then we'd bring it back to the warehouse yeah, and, and charge, charge it. Mm -hmm. So do any companies have that kind of plan in place? Or you know, do you know if, if Spasado as a big firm, do they oh, they have, have a central location to do that? Nowhere were in the middle of the day they could run back, no. They're, 
given our traffic in the summer season, there's not a single landscape company or tree company that would be close enough for that. I imagine that they charge overnight and mm -hmm. first thing in the morning, everything is fully charged from the shop, but they need to charge during the day. I yeah, think is and we do, we do the same thing. So we do the same thing at the public workshop. You go in at the end of the day, they'll have stuff plugged into charge. But like Spazato, for example, they have a trial going on in a large development south of here and they take two to three batteries per piece of equipment, have a trailer set up where they consistently and consistently swap them out. So they were, it was a noise thing for that particular community because environmentally, I mean, maybe it's a little better, but it's not, it's not great, right? A generator or a diesel truck running. So, and that's, that's their trial. They're seeing how it works and maybe it'll prove successful. Maybe it won't. Probably it'll be somewhere in the middle with lessons learned and things that can be adopted. I mean, maybe you have two batteries per piece of equipment and it just, you use them until they run out, I, you know, but then you're carrying double the equipment, so. <laughs> what about a charging station in downtown Rehoboth that they could go to and plug stuff in? Every single landscaping company? <laughs> Whatever would be practical. I'm, I think I'm just one of the, think of one of the things that issue. you have to factor in to that also is your man hours working, and that takes a lot of time to be doing all those things, and that's what, you know, contractors, when they bid jobs, it's not just the equipment cost, it's also the cost of the labor. So we have to yeah. be sensitive to when, that. And when I used to- They go out, their, their employees go out for the day, they work eight hours and they come back. And that's, that time is spent working, not- Yeah, they <laughs> work- I just think we have to be sensitive to This that. time of year, they're working more than eight, more than likely. Like when I used yeah. to, and what a lot of people don't realize, when I used to bid my tree jobs in my last company, you're paying for the travel time as the client. The company's not eating that. If I charged $100 a man hour and your job site was an hour away, you paid $100 an hour for four guys, $400 for them to drive there. So if we're making them redeploy, go back and forth, all that does add up. They're gonna need more staff, right? To get the same amount of work done with less equipment that's not as efficient, unfortunately. And right now with a staffing shortage, I don't even see how that's feasible. Granted, that could be solved. Um, but we're just, you know, the city, we have our shops, but we cert that's certainly not conducive to landscape companies coming back there to charge all their equipment in the middle of the day. Could we maybe work something out where our contractor could? Possibly. It's not like we have a ton of space down there either, though. We're pretty, Mike runs a pretty tight ship down there keeping things in their place, so. I mean, if we had to, we could, but. Well, uh, I'd like to point out that I have a contractor who mows my grass, Ed O'Connor. Anybody want to contact him? He does strictly all electric lawn maintenance. Uh, good guy. I like to support him. And I invite him to charge up his batteries at my house using the solar panels on the south side of my house. So I think we're pretty clean and green. I'm also on order for an F-150 uh, electric lightning all-electric pickup truck, which has outlets on the back, which can be used to recharge batteries or anything else or to run a power saw or whatever else might be needed. So uh, these are things which are right on the cusp of happening. I'm glad to see them happen. It'll mean that we won't have the sorts of arguments of oh, it's gonna be more polluting to use an electric whatever. Uh, so I would urge us to move forward and to set high standards and give people the incentives to move into the future before we're running on a sunny day flooding like the <coughs> Gazette seems to point out is happening in Lewis so that we uh, can do this small part to uh, tackle our global warming contribution. And, and we have, when I was in Montgomery County, they had a um, one landscape firm, and it was just him and like two or th two guys, I think, that rode with him, and they were all, that was their selling point 10 years ago. They were all electric. Now, I don't know the details on how they got the electric power. I mean, it's just two or three of them, so they're not hitting 100 sites a day. But that's, that was his marketing ploy, so. And it worked, he was very popular and very well liked. And that was 10 years ago. <laughs> so it, it can be done, especially on a small scale like that. Um, but like. May, maybe that's a, a way forward for now, is finding guys like that. And maybe we could use lines in the sand, which has been spectacular lately and keeping everybody informed and get that information out to everybody. If more people hired guys like that, 
um, that would certainly sway things more in our direction. So maybe if we could phase things in for Sposato to say do 10% of this year, 10% the next year, 10% so that they're it'd be phasing in so they wouldn't have to replace everything all at once in one fell swoop. Well, I think just if, uh, you know, the homeowners of Rehoboth had a little information. They said, oh, well, I could hire this long guy and he uses all electric. I want to support that. And so they call that guy and give him their money, right? So we pay with our dollars and move that forward. I think that information would be great to give to people. And I think a final mm -hmm. date like 2025 or 2026 might be helpful because you can see this looming in the future to be a little bit creative rather than say, you know, it's too much. It's too much. We can't, we can't do it. We can't plan, you know. I don't, I just don't see how you put a date on something for technology that doesn't exist yet. Probably will by 2025. I'd be surprised if it didn't, but I don't think that's reasonable, honestly. I mean, we could maybe put a goal something educational and informative and like you said encourage people to go that way this is the direction we're looking in this is the direction of the future there are several contractors that do this you know you can't advertise for contractors but a good reputation means a lot in any industry so i i i agree with the this education piece and and like i've said not just about this but other other topics as well I really think that we need to utilize things that are already existing, lines in the sand, Main Street, the chamber. Ask them to have um, certifications that these businesses have certified that they're plastic free or straw free, whatever the case may be, or these, these um, businesses um, provide electric landscape services. Um, and let them do the heavy lifting and the work to educate and get the word out. Um, I, again, I, 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 I do think that we need to strive and we need to have goals and, and, and yes, yeah, sometimes regulation, but there's a lot of opportunity out there with education that we sometimes completely miss and <laughs> strive just for the regulation. Um, so um, if no one has any further questions for Liz, I'd like to hear from the public, and then we can sort of take what our, our action plan will be uh, moving this forward or, or not. Anyone from the public like to, to say anything? If you could come up to the mic and just state your name and your, your address or your affiliation. I agree with Liz. I, I don't know how you can put a date when the technology isn't there. I also agree with encouraging homeowner, like for example, I do my own yard work. We have some electric, we have some gas. We have, uh, we intend to replace, for example, our gas lawnmower with a battery powered one when it fails. We don't necessarily wanna be forced to go out and buy new if what we have still works. So um, I think that has to be kept in mind. Not that we couldn't, but I, there, are, there are some people here that just, you know, we have a neighbor who has three lawnmowers in his garage. He picks them up when people have put, out, put them out in the trash, finds out they work, he keeps them, they're back up. You know, he's, he's not going to be receptive to having to go out and buy a new lawnmower when he has lawnmowers that work. So that's, that's the one thing. I do agree, though, with the city um, trying to set examples where they can. For example, if you know if they need a new weed whacker and the battery on the weed whackers will last long enough, or or they can get enough at a reasonable cost to be flipping them out, that's one thing. But um, you know, to your point, if somebody has to go back to some place and take the time to charge things, it's going to cost us all more in the long run. So thank you. A question for Liz, which would be. Uh, do we have a plan for the city to only replace old gas equipment with electric when the old gas stuff has seen better days? I mean, is that our gotta, plan? You heard what equipment I have. I have very, I have very little. So I don't think I personally need a written out plan like Spazato would need, budgeted against income. I've had the current weed whacker for like four years. When it goes, I will definitely look into electric, and if it meets our needs, we'll purchase it. 
the backpack blowers I know do not meet our needs currently. And if we had to get a little handheld one, electric would be perfect for that. But you can't blow off a road with a 120 mile an hour blower, unfortunately. That's what I have in my house. It's great for a driveway that's on an angle. It's not great for a permeable um, asphalt parking lot like we have at City Hall. <laughs> so, but like I said, by the time by the time I need a new backpack blower, say it stops working two years from now, we would definitely look into electric if it was comparable. And the comments from the, the public? I would like to um, identify, is it Brenna? <laughs> uh, uh, Brenna Rose Bruff, Bruff, Bruffery? Bruffery. Um, is joining us today. She's an environmental science uh, major at Villanova and here and is here for the summer and she's watching environmental policy in in action uh, so thank you for being here um, what's the what's the the desire of the committee it sounds like there's a suggestion we ought to hear from people like Osado do you want to invite them to a future meeting I think it would be good to hear from the larger firm and the the smaller guys too, you know, and just see what kind of an impact it would have on, a, you know, a guy that is running with the bare minimum. Um, Maybe Charlie Wilson, yeah. I mean, whoever you're, sure. I mean, I'll I'll just be sure to speak, speak in, yeah. into the mic. I'll be sure and, and invite Ed O'Connor for the next meeting if you want me to. Please do. And I'll work with Liz uh, to invite a few other larger yeah. folks. Okay, so I, we've got a, a game plan forward on, on that front. I'm gonna skip around the agenda because we've got Liz here and we wanted her opinion on the pollinator garden. I'm gonna take that subject next unless anyone has an objection. All right, Charlie, you authored the, uh, the proposal for the pollinator garden. Um, Liz has, I sent Liz a copy of that so she has seen it. Unfortunately, we did want the opinion of uh, Rehoboth Beach Main Street and Reho uh, Rehoboth and Bloom. Um, Sydney was going to join us, I'm not sure. Um, she, she's not here, but we'll try to get some feedback from her at a, a later time. But you wanna take it away, Charlie? Sure. Uh, just in summary, in previous meetings, we've discussed the idea of encouraging more pollinator-friendly perennial plants in Rehoboth so that we might become butterfly capital of the state of Delaware or some other superlative for us here uh, that we're we note again the city of Lewis is sort of ahead of us in that regard they've got Lewis in bloom which has been award-winning terrific uh, show of flowers and other things that are good for the environment and we have now a Rehoboth in bloom organization which is trying to catch up with the Lewis in bloom people and uh, Cindy is our head of the Lewis of the Rehoboth in bloom group hopefully she can come next time and share her wisdom with us uh, but the theory is, we've also had here in this meeting room, uh, Doug Ptolemy, who is a professor, Dr. Ptolemy is a professor at the University of Delaware, talking about the decrease in the number of birds and bees and butterflies worldwide, not just here in Delaware, but some of the ways that we can help those uh, species which are in trouble is to have uh, plants available for them that help their survival and including trees like oak trees especially are extra good for uh, survival of uh, caterpillars and others which feed the birds which feed the you know uh, the, the, the caterpillars become butterflies and other sorts of moths that can be pollinators and all that would be good for uh, that sector of the environment the bee pollinator bird tree sector so this is uh, the general background for why we were thinking we could do something in that regard whether it's mandatory or educational at first uh, remains to be seen. <coughs> Certainly we could suggest that wherever there is uh, grass that's not necessary for croquet or walking on or something like that in our parks, we might provide more spaces set aside for pollinator plantings, um, purple cone flowers, uh, black-eyed Susans, all those sorts of things you may have seen. So I don't wanna run on too much, uh, Edward, uh, what do you want to go next? Do you want to hear from Liz? Or? Yeah, yeah, I'd like, um, Liz, Liz has seen the proposal, uh, so I'd like to, to hear from her and, and get her um, opinion and expertise on the, on the matter. 
there were quite a few things in the draft um, about pesticides and um, the SB 22. So I don't know if you guys want to talk about them too, or we want to stay just on pollinator gardens. It's up to sure. You. Yeah. Pesticides okay. killing butterflies, not so good in our opinion. Well, so I don't know if anybody remembers this. It's probably been about 10 years now, and it's like the big example as to, and keep in mind, I've, I have worked with pesticides my entire career in one form or another. Um, so I have, I've had pesticide license in three different states, and I currently have like three or four different categories for Delaware. So I know quite a bit about that. And they require a lot of continuing education for all of those. Um, in New York specifically, when I have my pesticide license, New York City is very restrictive. Um, so I've dealt with all of that my whole career. Um, the thing with the pesticides, there was this example, it was a big box store, I don't know, 10 years ago, and somebody took a non-selective pesticide and sprayed a bunch of flowering linden trees. Why they would ever spray them when you can do a systemic treatment, can't answer you. It was somebody uneducated doing inappropriate application methods. And I think that person killed 50,000 bees. So they came to the parking lot and it was just littered with dead bees. Bees, And I mean, it might have even been 100,000. It was that dramatic. So that has become like the sticking point throughout the entire US about um, that particular pesticide, I believe, was a midocloprid. Um, and the best practice would have been to, in the early morning or in the evening, when the bees are less active, when the trees are not flowering, to have done a systemic injection treatment. So the person did nothing right. But it's an example of how any anybody without training or education can just go buy something off the shelf at Lowe's or Home Depot and one person can create this havoc. Um, that's not to say that 95% of the people, the companies applying pesticides don't employ the correct techniques and methods, right? Because what they were treating was more of an aesthetic thing. It was, I believe it was aphids. So they create this honeydew that land on the cars when they parked. It wasn't really killing the trees, so to speak. Um, so they call that, like in Tacoma Park, for example, they, years ago when I was working there, they banned cosmetic pesticide use and they listed all of them and they have like a hundred chemicals you cannot use there. And it was a big change because it was like in the middle of my career there, they banned them. And I had hundreds of clients there <laughs> that were using some sort of treatments um, most companies employ with some sort of um, IPM, which is integrated pest management. So basically you do a lot of scouting, you monitor populations in damage, and you only treat when necessary. So for example, our contractor who takes care of Lake Girard, every time they see one little palm weed or one little piece of algae, they don't just grab the pesticides and start sprinkling them all over the pond. They monitor them. They have experience. They can see if there's this much algae, and this is the forecast. We could forecast 90-something degrees, hot and sunny. It's going to bloom. Treat it proactively until, before it gets worse and requires three times the amount of pesticides, right? So good companies practice that. But that's easier said than done, because you have to be very knowledgeable to do that. Um, I think Delaware has not been as intense on pesticide use as the other states I've practiced in. Like there's more posting requirements in New York and Maryland. Um, Maryland, for example, if you want to fertilize a tree or a lawn, you have to provide a soil test every three years. This is when I was there, it could have changed. You have to provide a soil test every three years and you have to make sure what you're fertilizing needs fertilizer. <laughs> you don't just fertilize because, hey, here's something I can sell. Um, and once again, good companies should do that anyways, because if you want to put out a good product, you should be doing the right stuff. Um, and I would adjust, we did that, and I would adjust my treatment plans based on those soil test results. So can't speak to everybody else, and you have to be knowledgeable to read them, 
Stool test costs thirty dollars. It's not that big of an investment. Um, but like I said, I, as a state, we have not done as well as other states that I've worked in with that. Um, like New York, for example, to get your pesticide license, they have three different levels, and you have to have a certain number of hours trained under somebody licensed before you can even sit for the exams. In Delaware, anybody here could go sit down and take that exam right now, whenever you wanted. And in my experience, they're not that difficult. So, um, and we do have the CEUs and all that, and it's gotten harder, I think, as the years have gone on in Delaware. But we, I haven't seen the push, like when I was working in Maryland, to really limit pesticide use. Um, and we had a big organic section to the company I worked at, too, where I sold a lot of organic products, um, which aren't necessarily the be-all, end-all. Because you might have an organic lawn weed killer. We had one called Fiesta, this was once again years ago. It was twice the price, and it killed about 20% of the weeds. <laughs> so we're applying it twice as often, and the client's still not happy, right? I would hope that that's a lot better now. I haven't kept up with that since I don't do lawn weed treatments, but um, I think. Delaware will eventually catch up and go in that direction more, hopefully. Um, but I think it's always been more of a grassroots effort for that type of stuff. In terms of SB 22, that's interesting because, once again, I think we were a little bit behind other states. But we got there, and that's important. And they have a really good list of plants, if you look at it. I don't know how, since it hasn't started yet, I think it's July. I don't know how well it's going to work or who's going to enforce it because last time I was at Home Depot and Lowe's, they still had English Ivy for purchase. <laughs> and anybody can go online and buy stuff too. Um, and maybe maybe July 1st or whatever the date on SB22 comes and they will completely limit that. I don't know. It's possible. Um, but like I said, once again, we five years behind Maryland with that type of stuff. And I can tell you, even in Maryland, once they had it, you would still see some invasive plants for sale at some of the nurseries. Um, I'm not sure how the city would do that, ban that, because we we don't have any garden scent. Like, SB 22 is for the nurseries and garden centers to stop it at its point coming into the state. It's not to stop people from purchasing, planting. Like if somebody decides to take a piece of ivy that's growing in their yard and then divide it in 30 pieces and plant it in the rest of the yard, that SB 22 is not going to prevent that. Um, so I, I'm not sure how we would do that as a, as a city. I know um, the tree committee for some time has wanted to undertake something to do with ivy. And so. They have a meeting on Friday. It very well may be brought up then, but that's been something they've been trying to address is English ivy specifically since that's in town. Where I've dealt with invasive plants many, many years. We are not that bad in our natural areas and our yards compared to most places. English ivy and um, vinca or periwinkle are probably the biggest ones. Um, okay, now the pollinator garden. So. I'm assuming you guys want Cindy here because the city, so Rehoboth and Bloom has all their flower pots throughout town. And Cindy always has, they, she has so many great ideas. And she came to Sharon and I in the fall or the spring a while ago and was asking if she could take on a garden. So Lewis and Bloom has several gardens and Rehoboth and Bloom pretty much has just done um, pots at this point, planters. And so we went back and forth on good spots, and I eventually suggested um, the one area we didn't landscape at the museum, because when the canal dock was going on, everything was in flux, so I didn't include it in my plans. So we gave her, there's a very strange section of grass between the south base of the museum and Rehoboth Avenue. So there's like two pieces of sidewalk, the front of the museum, and just two patches of grass there. 
So that was one of the areas we came up with. And um, I know Cindy and her people are super excited. I think they want to do a pollinator garden unless something has changed. Um, so that's probably what she was going to talk about, is going to be my guess. Um, and I believe she's working on plans now to present to the city manager and I, basically for stamp of approval. Um, I imagine there won't be any issues with it. Um, in terms of other pollinator gardens, I try to look more holistically than just focusing on pollinators. So we have to incorporate green infrastructure, drainage things, rain gardens. We have to garden for the future. And that means thinking about climate change. So plants that were at one end of their, our, their range or another, which in our zone that happens a lot, some of those plants 10 years from now may not do well here. So whenever we have a landscape design, that's something they look at, that what plants are gonna thrive not only now, but five, 10 years in the future. Certain plants may be shorter lived, like an echinacea, they maybe only live five years, right? So we don't worry so much about them. Um, but if you look, when we did Rehoboth Avenue landscaping, the original 10 streetscape 10, 15 years ago, it was, I wanna say like kind of basic in the plants they chose, barberry, juniper, um, your typical, typical stuff. What I've done since I've been here is when we do a design, we try to do mostly natives. I wanna say 75 to 90% natives depending on the site. And that's not including street trees because that's a whole different beast. But when we do a garden, we have to recognize along a road in commercial areas and stuff like that. Natives won't always necessarily thrive. But like certain things like rutabecchia, coneflower, um, cat mint, these ones that we love for pollinators and birds. I mean, we have coneflower out here and the birds just tear them apart in the fall. Um, we have always tried to incorporate that. Like I said, we don't, I don't advertise them as a pollinator garden because it's so much, it's more than that, what we're doing. We're hitting all these different, like Lake Avenue phase two. I wanna say almost, I think everything in that landscape plan is native. And then on top of that, we have shelter, we have the infiltration basin, which serves as a treatment and storage to supplement Lake Girard. We did so many things with just that one triangle that to put the label of pollinator garden on it isn't accurate. Sure, it supports pollinators, but it does like six other uh, things too. Um, smaller little areas, you know, like the size of this table, I think it'd be perfect for a pollinator garden, tiny little spots. But there's no reason on a private property you couldn't have a rain garden that is a pollinator garden. And I think that's an easier sell because it addresses more things um, than just a pollinator garden. Let me see what else we have. And I love that you mentioned the oaks, the white oaks specifically, or I think like 75, 90% of the United States, a white oak is the best plant you can plant for pollinators because they have hundreds of different Lepidoptera that use them. Um, but the one that we haven't mentioned is the monarch butterfly, and that's what everybody thinks of, right? So we are part of, I mean, they get here when, I mean, all year round, but we're part of like their fall migration. And what they love is the goldenrod. And we have a lot of goldenrod in our dunes and on a few of our select street ends. So they stop there and they feed on that goldenrod in the fall, and it's one of the only things flowering. Um, but the big push for the monarchs is the milkweed because that is the only plant that they actually like, I think it's like the only one that they can actually lay eggs on and like the only one, maybe the larvae, I could be getting this wrong, but the larvae only feed on that. After that, they can go to all your other different plants and somebody else may know more than me about that, but I do know that the goldenrod is an important one for us here specifically um, in the mid-Atlantic area. And unfortunately with golden or with the milkweed, there's really only one, um, the butterfly weed that people find visually 
attractive, I guess I want to say, that people actually will plant in their gardens normally um, to plant the other, like the, I think it's like a swamp milkweed or something. You almost have to plant it because you want the monarch butterflies, whereas the butterfly weed is actually beautiful and gets incorporated in lands. Beautiful in most people's eyes, I'll put. Because the number one area I get complaints about are the street ends that have all native June grasses and <laughs> like yucca and yarrow and goldenrod, and we get a few complaints about them every year. And they're probably the best for our pollinators. <laughs> um, and, you know, we try to explain that, but people's. What kind of complaints do you get about that? It looks unkempt, which is natural. Yeah, so. I, you know, we manage them in a, a certain way, and it's not my personal taste, and I think why people come to the beach, too, is the more cottage look. So, like, the hydrangeas, the beach grasses, not sheared hedges. That's not what you think of when you come to the beach. Um, so I always think those little mini dunes fit in very well, but some people like manicured hedges of boxwoods and you know, cherry laurels and, you know, your traditional roses. And they, they certainly have their place. I mean, our roses are gorgeous, we have. But, and they, they're cottagey too. But um, it's just one of those things they seem natural, like the whole, there was the no mow May. I don't know if anybody read about that. Basically, don't mow your yard for May and see what happens. <laughs> and the amount of complaints I'm sure that people got about that was because it looks, the, the quote is, it looks unkempt. Well, it's not unkempt, it's, it's a garden, it's supposed to be natural or it's a dune. Um, so you do have to, I don't wanna say like fight, but kind of make your in, intention known. Like in Montgomery County, they have, um, they did a really big like swale rain garden program. Years ago, they started it. And I wanna say like a year ago, I saw an article and it, it's like, ah, the public is still divided. Some people love it, think it looks great, works great, and some people think it's unkempt and ugly, right? So there is that kind of stigma you have to fight a little bit when you have a more natural yard and more natural garden without a lot of lawn. And with leaving, say, the coneflower, leaving those spent heads up and not deadheading them, well, they're important. The birds come and get the seeds, but it looks like you're not maintaining it. So uh, it's a little bit of an education thing with that, in my opinion. But personally, I'd say the less, the less lawns, the better. And I have not converted, in my mind, I don't think I've converted anything from plants into lawns since I've been here. Um, our big project we're working on is the State Road Triangle, which was just a, I don't know, a pile of weeds, basically. And it's still going to have some turf on it. Um, if do you guys know where that is, State Road Triangle? Okay. It's still going to have some turf because people walk there and we need safe passage, but we're talking like three to five feet on the perimeter. So other than that, it's going to be like 90, I think we have like maybe five non-native shrubs in there and like 97% of the plants are all native. So, and which will all support pollinators. The state has a drain in there. So it has, we'll have a lot going on in that. But to the naked eye, it'll just look like a beautiful landscape garden. <laughs> so it, it sounds like in practice, <clears throat> as you're looking at projects in the city, you you are always looking at not calling it a pollinator garden, but them still doing the job as a pollinator yeah. garden. Yep. I <clears throat> so we we covered three things to in in Liz's. Um, discussion of, of the proposal. We've got pesticides, SB 22, and pollinator gardens. Um, any specific questions for, for Liz or, or further discussion? Well, the one thing that I had <coughs> talked about earlier uh, in earlier meetings is that um, Newcastle County and also the state of Delaware have um, rule for themselves that when they plant on their own uh, properties they only use native plants and so that was m my thought that in our common areas of Rehoboth Beach when we're doing any new project um, to limit ourselves in that way and um, 
you know, I know you did just say sometimes native plants won't thrive in certain conditions and and so forth, but I know that the state and also Newcastle County has has that particular um, rule. So. That's, it's interesting you say that, so maybe Del Dot's exempt, but when they did all that landscaping in the median, they were not all native um, along Route 1. There were several Japanese in there. Nothing invasive, but perfect example, like a lot of native plants would do well in there, but you're in a spot in the middle of Route 1 where you can't expect to be able to do 100% native and still meet other goals. 75, 90, sure. Um, because in general, native plants are better. I mean, I spent years and years killing invasive plants, so I'm very much a fan of, of the native plants, and I find them more beautiful than a lot of the non-natives myself. Um, that being said, we can't, like for example, a street tree that's gonna live in a three by five pit, the native trees for the most part will hate that. <laughs> they will absolutely hate it. On the same sense, it drives me nuts in the parks when, and these trees have been there, when I see a purple plum planted in the middle of like five acres at Lake Girard, right? Why a purple plum? Why there? Why not a white oak? So, you know, everything taken with the, the grain of salt pretty much with that. Um, but yeah, we do almost all natives. So, and I think a lot of landscapers are doing that now too. Um, maybe not like a builder grade, but you know, a lot of people put, went somewhere the other day and um, the person told me that they spent $100,000 landscaping the property and it was gorgeous. I mean, you could tell they had hydrangeas and peonies and I think they had like a row of boxwoods. They had some river birds. They had a mixture of different stuff. A lot of natives, some not natives, um, but beautiful. And I think here people want things to be beautiful and it's just a matter of getting all the designers and landscapers on board. I, f I feel that it's what you're saying is it's about the education and it's about the Isn't acceptance. It always? I mean, <laughs> we have the in our yard gorgeous mm -hmm. butterfly bushes and they're in full bloom even though the deer sit in the middle of my most prosperous <laughs> butterfly bush. Of course they, they, do. they love, they <laughs> love it. But I saw a monarch yesterday. And the yuccas at our driveway are majestic. I mean, they are abs they're in full bloom, hmm. absolutely majestic. Um, we get complaints. I, I think we, we get need complaints about maybe yuccas. some workshops because Delaware, in its nature, is basically forest land. Yards, grass are not native. The, we don't do well with either the northern grasses or the southern grasses, but this is what we work on so hard it's the way people like you're saying look at what is well kept what is nice but this is not delaware this is not delaware's nature I, and you know i think the workshops maybe we could have some workshops I, I don't know who put it on but i remember i attended a pollinator seminar here maybe f four or five years ago not here then no. fire hall I, no, I, it was right after this. Right after we opened. We, yeah, was it the opening. Doug Talame one? Because um, the tree committee, because um, when Sturgis Dodge is on it, her husband works for University of Delaware, so yeah, he I, had the connection to get Doug Talame. And I know they've been taught, once again, this might come up on Friday because um, they have their meeting. So I can certainly kind of relay information. Maybe they can touch base. Um, but I know they were talking about doing more workshops, whether it's a twice a year thing, and they were talking about who to get, what to focus on, um, who to get for free, because <laughs> normally Doug Telame is not a, not a cheap one to come, and um, we were able to use connections for that, and everybody loved that presentation. But I think people also don't, about pesticides and herbicides. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. you know, um, in all different shapes, going back well, in all different shapes. And so what do you do? And then we get stuff in our mailboxes about all these people that spray for mosquitoes and stuff. Yep. So I happened <laughs> yes. to call the state just this, I mean, just this morning I spoke with Bill. And they come out at night. They come out at night and spray. They, they let you know, and this doesn't kill bees. 
because mm -hmm. it's, it's the best time, yeah. Yeah, but again, it's education. It's helping people do what they need to do, which is, I mean, mosquitoes have been terrible. They have, yeah. Liz, I know we, we, we do a good job on the tree front, educating homeowners what, mm -hmm. what trees they we try. can and can't. <laughs> um, do, do we have any education piece on pesticides, plants, the reasons why you know pollinator gardens are, are good or rain gardens? Rain gardens, possibly, but plants other than trees, I wanna say on our city website, no. I mean, we'll do stuff about like Lake Girard, we'll do stuff about native plants, but not specifically about pesticides. I mean, for example, so say you wanna go spray weeds in a sidewalk. For example, our contractor does both sides of Rehoboth Avenue and the median, all the curbs and all the sidewalks. That's a multiple miles, okay? To physically remove those by hand is kind of crazy. You know, that's like asking to get run over by a car. When you spray those, you have about two to three percent of actual glyphosate, like which is the main ingredient in Roundup, two to three percent. The other 97 should be water. Now you add in a surfactant, which is usually like some organic type of sunflower oil. It's very little when you, it goes back to that IPM, like used appropriately, it's is not the problem. It's doing a lawn application and ending up with the granules all over the driveway that don't get blown back into the yard that then wash into the storm drain that then flows into Lake Girard that then flows into the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> so it's kind of that, that chain effect. And we, I don't know if Lines in the Sand just came out, but we had worked, I had worked with Lynn on a, just a little blurb about algae blooms and it's, it's from runoff, whatever runs, because lawn has a very high runoff quotient, much higher than plantings or trees. I mean, it's, it's getting borderline close to concrete when you have a lawn. And whatever you put on that lawn can run off. And then it runs into the road and it picks up all, everything that's in that road. We have great street sweeping program, great leaf pickup. We clean out all our drains. You do everything we can, but it has to start at the property owner. They have to retain their stormwater on their property. And they have to make sure that if they are using, we're not gonna stop people from fertilizing their lawns, right? But we can make sure that they're doing it appropriately, they're having soil tests. And we can encourage people that are in between like to maybe have more gardens because I, to me like a garden is, or the lawn is, if you have kids that wanna play on it, it's for curb appeal, curb appeal in the front. People love seeing that green lawn. So that's where we go back to the education. Hey, check out this. I can think of a couple of houses that did really beautiful landscape designs. It kind of eliminated the lawn for the most part and see the beauty in this. And people have this in their mind that gardens are higher maintenance than a lawn. And I, a lawn has to be mowed every 10 days. It has to be fertilized. It has to be treated for weeds. It has to be edged and blown off. You can go out and weed your garden every two, three weeks. And if you plant the right kind of ground covers, a little bit of mulch and you're, you're good to go. And lawns have very high input and a very high pesticide use relatively. So if we could encourage gardens in place of the lawns with native plants, so we hit the pollinators, and then we're gonna cut down on lawnmower and blower use, so it's a win-win. <laughs> I just and saw, we just solved both the problems. And, and then permeable driveways. I mean, yep. and non-permeable driveways. And I mean, this has a whole lot to do with, well, I mean, it's. Storm, it's all, like I said, it's holistic. It's all tied together. We can't say pollinator garden and pesticide use without talking about front off and rain gardens and maintaining stormwater on your own properties. I mean, there's so many things you can do with that that are cheaper than a permeable driveway. That's a pretty big expense. Rain barrels, not a huge expense, 100 bucks. Um, you, they have underground systems that are kind of like rain barrels in a way. Um, also not a huge expense. 
So those are things, and unfortunately, some of that may have to be regulated. But I, I think there's, uh, I, I'm not sure everyone is aware, but we recently um, created a stormwater task force, um, which is, I, I think, looking at sort of a utility rate related to that. I'm assuming that out of that will be incentives um, that could reduce the rate. I, I don't know if they've gotten that far yet, but if there are incentives, it's a good opportunity for us to promote the use of, of native plants and pollinators in terms of with, with controlling runoff of, of properties if out of this group comes incentives, which I, I'm not sure if they will or not, but it, there's certainly an opportunity there yeah, I mean, I know a lot of communities that do that type of tax, and you, I want to say I remember a place where they actually re like paid part of the cost to, say, pull out a patio if you actually, like, undid what you had done. They actually paid, paid you to do that. Yeah, or provided some sort of tax reduction or whatever way um, they did that. Because when we do those, we have to make really, really sure that we're not penalizing the existing homeowners while rewarding the new construction who's at a better advantage to, say, put in an underground storage system. Because, hey, the ground's already ripped open, everything's already gone, we just shove these couple of tanks in there, we're good. Whereas somebody that's house has been there since 1950, they're not gonna rip up everything to, to do that necessarily. Um, but I mean, the state used to have a reduced rain barrel, reduced price rain barrel programs. I, I have a couple in my house, I love them. It completely, I had a little bit of flooding issue. Three rain barrels completely resolved it. Like it, it was amazing. I was thinking about digging it up and putting in all of this fancy stuff. And I was like, well, let me just buy these $100 rain barrels and see how it goes and knock on wood. Like a year later, I haven't had any problems. Just that simple, $300. I did it absolutely by myself. I just set a rain barrel down underneath the gutter. Now I know we have a lot of rentals and that may not make sense for them, but it's a, it's a very easy fix. It's very easy to incorporate when we're building new homes to have a certain amount to require calculations from an engineer. This, you need to be able to retain 10 year storm on your property. We haven't gone there yet. We did put in a new stormwater ordinance, if you guys have noticed the silt fence and all that around. So the state, they require any development land disturbance over 5,000 square feet follow this set of rules. Well, almost every lot we have is 5,000 or under, so they wouldn't get involved, the conservation district through DENREC. So the city did their own, and it's any disturbance, I think it's a 1,000 square feet. So basically, anytime anybody really does something in addition, a new house, they have to have silt fence, they have to have an entrance, and you've probably seen the big sign that says, if there's a problem, call us here. Um, because the number one, if you go to like the, they have a training, Certified Construction Reviewer, which is all about stormwater. If you go to that, the number one thing they tell you, if you retain one thing, is that the main pollutant is sediment and soils. So that's that's one of the main focuses. And um, I know two people in building and licensing have that certification. I've had it since I worked for EnviroTech in 2008. So <laughs> it's it's a good thing to have. And you know, keep in mind every time those soils run off they have pollutants in them themselves too. So it's we have a lot going on and the city has done quite a bit in the last few years, I think, to address it. Um, but there's always more to be done. But I think in terms of regulations, we've been kind of ramping it up. So it wouldn't surprise me if next steps were from the task force to increase regulation and provide incentives and stuff like that. And keep in mind, I'm not involved in the task force, so this is just my conjecture. Yeah, yeah. I, any other comments from the, from the committee? Then I'd like to go to the public, and then we can sort of figure out what the, our action plan is on the topic. 
I just want to thank you, Liz. That was really <laughs> educational. I feel like I learned a lot. And as somebody who can barely tell her rose bushes from her hydrangea bushes, <laughs> it was very educational. And, and just again, on the education piece, maybe it wouldn't be too much work to just have a place on the city website so that if I'm going to go to the nursery, I have a list to pick from. I think there's probably a lot more people that can't tell their rose bushes. <laughs> you guys are all really educated, but um, maybe just a quick list. Like, these plants are good. Stick yeah, I with mean, this. We don't have to reinvent the wheel for that stuff. It's probably already out there. I'm Delaware. Sure this is the yeah. State has yeah. A book okay. on yeah. Yeah, there's the Delaware Invasive Species Council. Like, honestly, that would probably be as simple as linking a few websites and making sure those links stay up to date. Um, but. I'm lucky because you guys actually picked two topics I know about, so I'm able, yeah. <laughs> so I'm able to speak about well, it was them. really educational. Thank <laughs> you. Yeah, I did owe that. And you I, picked I'm two writing, ones. I'm writing down all these <laughs> the plants and stuff. I'm like taking notes, so you know, uh, and I'm I'm just, I guess we're all somewhat in the field, and we were just educated here. I think so. Listen. And and I think by more education and putting things out like that, I think that you know you've got people that live here that I think want to do the right things they're at a beach resort to to do that so thank you again cool. so and it's so funny because i think what um one of the speakers said was hey when we get a new lawnmower it's probably going to be electric my dad was sending me links the other day he was like what do you think about this electric lawnmower because he has an old gas one that's probably like eight years old that's on its last leg he wouldn't just run out to buy one to be electric but if he's going to buy a new one it's going to be electric for exactly the reasons Number one, he just doesn't want to fool around with having gasoline in his garage. <laughs> it's Five dollars a, a gallon. It's a big. It might be ten. It's you a know, big incentive. You, what people I didn't realize this until the other day when I was thinking about it. That electric, you, it's a totally different maintenance. Um, you don't have oil changes with electric cars. <laughs> people don't. I was like, wait. So if you have electric car, you don't have to get your oil changed every three months that's great like that right there beats out any inconvenience of only having 250 miles um antifreeze all that you know well and then we have to think the mechanics who work on two-stroke engines which these big places will have like my last job we had a mechanic okay he worked on the trucks he worked on the two-stroke engines they're gonna have to get new training and relearn some of this stuff or maybe they'll have less work which wouldn't be a bad thing <laughs> Mm -hmm. It is beautiful. Time and money and knowledge, they spared nothing there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was working in New York when they were like starting to think about the High Line. <laughs> All right, I'd, I'd like to go to the public and see if there's any comments. Um, again, we've we've covered a lot: pesticides, SB 22, and and pollinator gardens and and rain gardens. Um, any comments from the public? Okay. Uh, where do we want to go with this? Well, we were going to have uh, Cindy from. I mean, I, I certainly think that finding resources that we can suggest the city um, for homeowners, I think, is, is a very good step um, where we can link to our website. So people, I, I mean, I'm, I'm one of those, I, I don't, it's a plan. I don't know what plan it is. I don't know, <laughs> I don't know if it's good or bad or a pollinator. Um, and I, I think a lot of people feel that way. So. I think a little education resources, um, I think, is important. I think that's one huge aspect of this, um, you know, and, and informing people about SB 22, and while it may not be a regulation for homeowners, but why are these things not 
allowed in Delaware anymore to be sold at nurseries. Um, so it's it's just educating um, um, is, is a huge aspect of this. Kind of a re-education about what is beauty, you know, what is beauty in, in the world. Okay, yeah. Um, thank you, Linda. Um, so I, I will have Cindy come uh, to the next meeting, um, and we'll get some input from her. Um, I, on the, I, uh, Charlie, if it, if it, if you want to, or someone else, maybe reach out to the, is it the Tree and Green Infrastructure Committee? I think someone making a connection with that committee. Um, and coordinate maybe some seminars, education efforts. If they're already doing it, just let them know that they've got the support of the Environment Committee behind them. It would be a tough job. My wife sits on that committee, so yeah. I just, uh, <laughs> ask like, them to come the next time we can talk about what they're doing. Let you guys <laughs> fight it out, right? But I know, I know they've been talking about it pretty consistently, so. I'm sure they'd be interested in doing something joint if everybody's interest overlapped. So native plants would probably be a good one. Likewise, I would invite all of our members of this committee to educate themselves on these topics. Come loose or bear with your ideas yeah. on how we can make this happen. Anybody you know that's that might want to come and speak for free. <laughs> Um, all right, Liz, thank you so much. This is, uh, we spent a lot of time on, on, on two topics, but I think it was very informative um, and, and very good um, for us to hear from you on, on those. And I think we've got a much better idea on, on how to proceed. And sure, if you, if you or any of the members have questions, you can always email me or they can always email you and you send it to me if they have any follow-up questions. Because like Great. I said, these are two topics I actually do know quite a bit <laughs> on. Don't ask me anything else you guys talk about, but <laughs> these I feel pretty comfortable on. And if you want any speakers from like the two companies we use, Sussex and Spazato, I'm sure they'd okay. be willing to set aside time. Yeah, I'll, I'll, um, I'll coordinate yeah. with you on that. All right. Thank you. Um, uh, I would like to update everyone. Or I, I, the update is not an update, but um, we had talked about um, installing city uh, water fountains, um, and uh, the city manager told me after that meeting that he and the, the public works director had already submitted some grants um, applications, um, and we've not yet heard back from them. So we're just waiting here back on those two. Uh, but I will say, um, with that also, there's an education piece. So I think the next time we, we talk about it, I'd like the committee to brainstorm about, well, yeah, we've got water fountains, but now how do you educate the public to stop mm -hmm. using plastic? Mm -hmm. You know, is it a Rehoboth Beach, is a BYOB, bring your own bottle, you know, or, or something, no, something like that. Um, mm -hmm. So I just want to just brainstorm about the education aspect of that and, and outreach. Um, unfortunately, we are way over time, um, but like I said, I think we, that was very educational and very good for me personally. Um, it's whole, I mean, it's holistic. Right. Uh, so um, we're going to have to uh, push the idling policy um, to the next meeting. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> can you make it? Can yeah. you make it quick? Could you make a real quick comment? We, do we have ten minutes? Okay. Um, we will. We will. We may not finish our discussion, but we'll at least start it and, and hear from the public. Um, Heather, I think you were pushing this one. Do you want to give a brief background and then um, where we stand on it? Yeah. Sure. Um, this came up in the beginning for our committee. Um, we all talked about it, and we, I did a little research and found that in uh, April of 2015, uh, the city passed a resolution uh, proclaiming that the city of Rehoboth Beach it would be an idle-free city, and that's on the city's website if anybody wants to go see it. I'm not sure if it's linked to the meeting minutes or not. It is linked. Okay, perfect. So you can, um, you can view that. 
Um, so recently, there have been a number of other cities that have been enacting idling laws. So we reviewed some of those. Uh, we reviewed the Delaware state law, and I spoke to somebody at DNR, and they she informed me that there's currently no Delaware state law regarding idling. So we wouldn't really be able to reply on that. Uh, rely on that. We would have to enact something of our own. Um, my first suggestion was to, uh, again, use the education piece and let everybody know that we do have this resolution on file uh, that everybody should abide by. Uh, and then I kind of left it up to Commissioner to you to uh, uh, think of any further steps that you wanted to take as far as um, making a recommendation to the city to um, codify it. Yeah, I, and I think from our, our initial discussions, about, I, I think there was a desire by the kitty the, the committee to codify that, um, what is already a resolution, um, turning that resolution into a, an actual ordinance um, so that there there would be some um, teeth to it and, and it could be enforced and have fines, et cetera. Um, so that's the desire um, that I heard from the committee. Um, my So the only problem with codifying it is there are going to be exceptions. Um, so I think that's the next step is what are those exceptions? So Delaware, so Newark has 12 exceptions. And again, they're linked in the information I sent you. I don't have a list of them right here. But they're pretty specific. And somebody who was an enforcement person would have to know them to be able to you know, enforce that law. So um, I, let's hear from the public yeah. um, on this topic. <laughs> Absolutely. If you could just yeah. uh, <laughs> state your name and, and your um, address. I'm Sheila Young, and I live on Henlopen Avenue near Grove Park. And I've actually reached out to the committee several times about this issue already through v emails to Charlie. Um, Grove Park is a de facto um, comfort station for contractors in the city. They use Grove, and I don't begrudge that. We love Grove Park. We love everything about Grove Park, the good and the bad. It's, it's a great place to live near, and we knew that coming into the city. However, um, there are large commercial vehicles that park on Henlopen Avenue and also on Grove Avenue, or Grove Street, whichever you call it, um, and leave their, their engines idling. And I'm not talking about for three or five minutes to use the bathroom. I'm talking about uh, 20 minutes, a half an hour, an hour. Um, they leave the vehicles unattended, and they also go into the city, usually Royal Farms, to get lunch. And then sometimes they sit in their vehicles and eat lunch while the vehicles are running. I've had to close all the windows on my porch and my house on so many occasions, I stopped counting. I have asked the drivers of these vehicles to please turn their vehicles off. Um, sometimes they do, most times they don't, and sometimes they become extremely belligerent. I've contacted many, if not all or most of the, and uh, you know, one of the largest offenders are the landscaping companies the big ones which have been mentioned today. Um, and I've been told that they would talk to the drivers about this issue, and I have seen no progress on that front. Um, so again, I'm very concerned. I'm concerned about uh, my personal health. I'm concerned about the health of the environment. And I think it just makes common sense that in the a day and the age of $5 or $6 a gallon gasoline that these engines should not be idling for uh, the times that they are. And this isn't just uh, related to, uh, you know, a certain time of year. It's year-round. I'm a year-round resident, and I see this year-round. And it's, and it's not just commercial vehicles, though. They are the, the, the biggest offenders. There are... Um, independent contractors, pickup trucks, and cars that do this in the vicinity of Grove Park. 
let me say amen to that, and I have received your emails in the past when I was acting vice chair or chair or whatever of this committee, and it's because of you and other people who've complained. Me too, I live right around the corner from you that we have made the progress that we're making now, seeing the previous ordinance which declared us an idling free city, but nothing's ever really been done because there's nothing to enforce there, and we're hoping that we might be able to make progress to get something to enforce. Well, the reason I'm here today is because I saw something on the agenda about citizens enforcement and I feel very strongly against that. I don't want to be the neighborhood Karen when it comes to idling engines and I don't think anyone else does either. We just, we want this to be curtailed and we, we need your help. It would, I think one of the first things that would be helpful is simple signs near the bathrooms that said, turn, please turn your engine off. I did a road trip to Boston earlier this year and every single rest stop and comfort station that we stopped at had those types of signs. Please turn your engines off or turn your, you know, don't idle your engine for more than three minutes. And did they stop their engines in these places you stopped? Yes, absolutely. Well, I, I just have a quick question. When you talk to these drivers, what do they say? What, uh, what's the reason they get for idling? Do they say anything or? Uh, well, so, so most of them don't really understand me. Okay, that's, that's a language barrier. That's, you know, and I even, please, please turn this off. Please turn it. That's a, another thing is like, you know, no, no, you know, and then, or call the company, and I've done that. Um, one gentleman that I was taking a picture of the truck so that I could call the company came out and started yelling at me and I said I, I said you know I, I asked you to turn your engine off and you, you refused and now I'm gonna call the company and he said hey lady I am the company <laughs> Wow! <laughs> so give a reason for why no, leave them no, I mean I, I, I get it you know they want to listen to music or put the air conditioning on or you know I, I get it and so maybe there are some things that could be done to help you know, set up a kiosk at Grove Park so that contractors could eat there in comfort. Or, you know, one time <laughs> a tour bus parked like right next to my house, an empty tour bus who had dropped off uh, some entertainment for uh, uh, the, whatever it's called. Festival <laughs> of some kind? No, the bandstand. The bandstand. Band <laughs> the bandstand, right. thank you. Senior moment. Um, and he, the driver parked the tour bus next to my house with the engine running and went to sleep. So he wanted to sleep in comfort. And the exhaust, you know, overwhelms my house, my porch. It's well, very frustrating. Um, I, I, we, we will continue to discuss, and I think there's consensus uh, here in the committee to, to codify this ordinance, but in the meantime, your specific issue, which I, I was not aware of, I will talk to the city manager um, and probably Liz Lingo, who has a relationship with a lot of the landscape companies, uh, to see if there's some education piece that we can we can do or like in the meantime. Like an official connection, right. Instead of um, I, <laughs> signs are there may be a few few areas in Rehoboth where signs make sense. Um, so I will talk to the city in the meanwhile, we will continue discussing, potentially codifying it, but in the meantime, I will talk to the city about that specific issue. Um, and I thank you very much thank for, you. for your thank input. You. Thanks for your patience. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I should have asked uh, in, at the beginning of the meeting why everyone was here. Uh, so I do make sure that we, uh, we do get to the topic that you're here for. Um, so thank you very much. Any other public comment on that specific topic? Well, um, I will. Um, we will continue discussion about this at the next meeting. Um, I may do some work with you, Heather, to actually codify um, and look at the exemptions. Um, with that, our, um, we're going to skip over new business. Um, I want to thank the city staff. Um, we went way over, and thank you for your patience. Um, 
I, one last thing I'd like to say is we do, um, we've lost quite a few members, so we do need new members on this committee. If you can think of anyone. There's one right there. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> that was great. Um, we are always looking for, uh, for committee members. So if you can think about that and bring any names to the next meeting. Um, any final committee member comments? Thanks everyone for coming today. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you for your participation. Your interest. Yeah, this is really helpful. Um, and our next meeting um, is the third Thursday of July at 10.30 a.m., which is the 21st. Um, any final citizen comment before we adjourn the meeting? And meeting adjourned at 12 o'clock sharp. Thank you, everyone. Well done, team. Oh, boy, that was fun.